second. Good evening and welcome to this lecture meeting on recent decisions on income tax. In the budget speech of 2020, the finance minister mentioned that there are about 483,000 cases in various appellate levels. Despite the improvement in India's ease of doing business rankings in recent years, one thing that really haunts the businesses in India is the tax litigation. Every day there are numerous judgments, but do they really provide justice? Are those decisions really followed in the right spirit? At and by the administration at various levels. Recent Supreme Court decision on the validity of notices issued under Section 148 during the period from 1st April 2021 to 30th June 21 has opened a Pandora's box and the tax professionals feel that certainly will increase the litigation. Logically, as professionals, we look forward to stability for the benefit of our SSEs and our clients once the appellate authority decides on the matter. But you will all agree that sometimes these judgments, as they keep on pouring, are the catalyst for further litigation and disputes, and one has to wait for years to get even semblance of justice. That is, if it is not repealed by the retrospective amendment. It is in this backdrop, given the far-reaching changes in the tax world, tax dispute resolution has become a focus area for many organizations. There are a large number of stakeholders who need to constantly keep tab on various decisions that affect the ecosystem in which their business operates. This is where sessions like today, especially when an extremely knowledgeable person like Advocate Hiro Rai is giving his incisive analysis, intricacies and rationale of these judgments make a lot of difference and add to our understanding. Such an analysis can help us adopting a broad framework of preventive measures and alternative dispute resolution strategies. With this small introduction on the topic, let me introduce BCS to people who may not have been fully aware of what BCS is all about. There may be new members, new entrants. So let me very briefly explain what BCS stands for. BCS is one of the oldest voluntary body of accountants with 73 years of rock solid history. It was established just six days after the ICAI and has more than 8,500 members. Its knowledge dissemination averages about 250,000 man hours every day, every year. Its publications with contribution by volunteers who are experts in the field have been much in demand. The journal published every month by the BCS is one of the most well-respected publication and is widely read across the industry, profession, and bureaucrats. And the vindication of this was when the CBDT chairman opened his talk while giving his interaction meeting said that he started his career reading the BCS journal. That was the ultimate uh, tribute to BCS. BCS over the years through its knowledge dissemin dissemination and dedicated efforts of the volunteers and networking platform has been responsible in creating several domain experts and leaders and has presence on all prominent social media and has substantial following there with about more than 40,000 followers. I urge you to reap benefits through 
maximum benefits through participation in several activities of the BCS. And you can access the BCS website for further details. It's www.bcsonline.org. That would help you to have the full view of these activities. With this, let me hand over the dais to Hardik, who's going to introduce the speaker. And I wish you a very good learning to all those online and those who are physically present. Thank you. Uh, respected President elect uh, Mirbai, uh, respected uh, Hirodai sir, the speaker for the session, Zubin Bai on the dais, seniors and friends of the dais, and more than 200 participants on the virtual uh, mode. It's an absolute privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, Hiro Rai, sir. Uh, we all know him. He has been, you know, guiding us uh, and, you know, uh, giving us this absolute gem, uh, you know, uh, lectures on uh, recent income tax judgment. Uh, to give a brief introduction of, sir, uh, he is a BCom graduate, law graduate and a charter accountant. He was a junior to uh, Mr. Dinesh Vyas advocate and thereafter to VH Patil for almost two years. He commenced his independent practice as a counsel in October 1984. He, he was a past president of ITAT Bar Association Mumbai. He has appeared in a wide variety of cases. Many of them have far reaching importance and we all refer them. Uh, he has been a regular speaker contributor at various conferences, seminars, meetings held by host of organizations, one of which is BCAS. Uh, with this brief introduction, I would like everyone to welcome sir with a loud of applause. And uh, uh, as a mark of uh, you know our respect to sir, I would ask uh, past president Gautam Nayak sir to hand over him the memento. Of... So the floor is yours. Mr. Mihir Shet, Mr. Billy Moria, Mr. Mehta, seniors in the profession and friends. A very good evening to each one of you. At the outset, my thanks to the BCAS for inviting me over this evening. Today, I shall be dealing with what I consider important decisions reported from April last year, which is when I last spoke on this topic. I will be starting with some Supreme Court decisions, then come to some High Court decisions, and then come to two or three tribunal decisions not in any specific order of importance, they're just random. I've tried to select decisions which are of general applicability rather than there are some gems of decisions, but they do not have great applicability. Those, therefore, I have excluded those, which I feel are of general application is what I have taken up. As I usually say, I am not one to comment upon the correctness or otherwise of any decision. If you feel that a decision is a bit too far-fetched, you can make your own assessment and probably dilute the reliance you would place upon that particular judgment. Also, it's important to appreciate not only that there is a judgment on a particular issue, but it makes sense to go behind the reasoning, the logic behind why the decision was arrived at in a particular manner. So this equips you not only qua that particular subject, but it sharpens you for later, later times also when 
you are faced with problems this methodology or this going into the reasoning the logic would help you in solving the subsequent problems with these few general remarks let's plunge straight into the decisions i think it is obvious that the first decision one would have to deal with is ashish agarwal 444 itr page 1 a lot has been said and written about this judgment i know that i am aware i have also read quite a bit but this decision being as important as it is there was no way in which i could exclude this from today's topic but yes i will not go into absolute detail nor will i go into the new provisions of 147 but yes i will spend a few minutes to bring out a few points <clears throat> first of all this decision holds that all the high courts were right in their view that post 1421 you cannot resort to the earlier provisions so they therefore go on to say that the revenue has made a bona fide mistake maybe because of the notifications etc they felt that they could issue the notice post but ultimately they hold that there is a bona fide mistake on the part of the revenue all the 148 notices are to be taken to be issued under 148a and they are to be treated as a show cause notice under 148 small b the court further directs the assessing officers to supply to the assessees all the information and material note these two words information and material which has been relied upon them to arrive at a possible conclusion that there has been escapement of income the assessee has to reply within 2 weeks thereafter we have also seen some of the notices which have come where they have been kind enough to say that if you have some difficulty you can seek extension so we are at that phase where most of those replies to these show cause notices are now going and of course after that within the time limit specified under 148a d the ao is to pass an order as to whether they are going to proceed with the reassessment once you are served with this order that is the point of time the assessees are to decide whether they are to participate in the reassessment proceedings or whether they feel it appropriate to challenge that order under 148 ad that would possibly normally be by virtue of a writ petition before the relevant high courts some i am told some petitions had already been filed we'll have to test this proposition whether these writ petitions will lie because some courts definitely are going to raise objections so let's see how that unfolds so let us proceed on the basis that yes at this stage you would be entitled to file the writ petition <clears throat> supreme court has also specifically said that whatever defenses are available to the ssc may be under 149 or whatever be the provisions <clears throat> whatever are the rights available to the department all these are safe and secure all these will be available to both the sides whatever rights whatever defenses they have under the new provisions of 147 to 151 all of them will continue to be available supreme court has applied article 142 of the constitution and it has also said that there's a broad consensus on the view that we are arriving at between the learned asc and the councils appearing on behalf of the assessees now this is in sum and substance what the decision has held a few thoughts to my mind one in para 7 of the judgment the supreme court clearly says that the new provisions of section 147 can be applied even to the earlier years this is very important 
because we had been thinking in terms of developing an argument that the new provisions of 147 apply only with effect from assessment year 21-22. This was because there was a feeling that there is a sea change in the provisions relating to reassessment. And it is not as if these were merely procedural provisions. So I am aware earlier Supreme Court has said uh, that 147 normally are procedural provisions. But looking to the complete change in the 147 proceedings, there was a thought that possibly this would apply from AY 21-22 onwards. But those hopes have been dashed. In Para 7, Supreme Court clearly says that the new provisions will apply even to the earlier years. <clears throat> Very disadvantages fall out of this is that assessees who earlier had a very good case under the old provisions, say there was a complete disclosure on my part. Therefore, I could resort to the proviso to section 147 where the assessment was being sought to be open post four years and there had been a scrutiny assessment. All those cases were great cases. Law was substantially settled. There was this concept of change of opinion. There were so many arguments which were available. Now, when the new provisions apply, say for instance, the first proviso to 147, which was available earlier, is not available now. So, assessees who had a great case under the old provisions, they are now at a very big disadvantage. Because as you're all aware, if you have studied the new 147 proceeding, uh, the pr provisions, the earlier provisions were much tighter. Today, the 147 proceedings, the provisions are very much more in favor of the department. Therefore, it is much easier to reopen a case today as it was under the earlier provisions. So all those assessees who are having uh, good cases in terms of the first proviso, etc., change of opinion, etc., I think they stand to be at a great disadvantage. I'm aware there is a very strong view that even under the new provisions, the change of opinion argument is available. Yes, I'm aware of that. And we have, do have a strong case, but still we have to convince the courts that the concept of change of opinion is still alive and kicking. Whereas under the old provisions, it was settled law. We had series of judgments. Now coming down to what is actually happening. Sadly, what is happening even in the notices that have come thereafter leaves a lot to be desired. I have already had the benefit of applying my mind to several of such notices. And one thing that is coming out very clearly in many of them, say for example, there was one allegation regarding penny stocks which you have claimed as exempt capital gains. They are saying that and they're attaching that note and just one piece of information. The point is the Supreme Court said that you are supposed to give the information and all material. What has come along with these notices is not all the material. There could be statements relied upon. There could be so many other things. None of them have come with these notices. So this is an aspect which one has to consider because in some of the replies we have told them that you're supposed to give me all the information as also material which has not been complied with by you There's so many so many arguments uh, just just to bring out one case which is absolutely absurd i'm dealing with a matter where there was a sale of certain shares and the consideration qua that particular SAC in as part of a family was about 55, 56 crores, consideration of the shares, out of which say 35,000 had been invested into mutual funds. Now in the original scrutiny assessment, those capital gains have been returned. Scrutiny assessment has taken place, all questions asked, all details furnished, capital gains accepted in 143.3 proceedings. During those proceedings, they asked for all the details regarding investment in the mutual funds, which were also given. The bank statements were given. Everything was given to show that this is sourced out of the consideration. And that was accepted in the original assessment proceedings. Now the notice which has come says, 
look at see the surprising the consideration of the about 56 crores the investment in the mutual funds was about 36 crores this notice now says <clears throat> that you have invested 56 crores in units and you have not explained the source thereof therefore we are reopening there's just no application of mind even that information which they are attaching clearly shows that that 56 crore is not the investment in the units it is a sale consideration and it is out of that 56 that the investment of 36 has been made no application of mind absolutely still they are stuck on the point that you have made investment of 56 crores in units and there is no explanation it's from unexplained sources how absurd there's no application of mind this is just one stark case i got so many absolute stark cases be that as it may that's the situation let's see how it goes ahead another aspect in respect of this decision i would like to bring out and maybe i may not be liked very much for what i say but i think it needs to be said to an extent it is us professionals also who are responsible for the present state of affairs i have personally experienced that in the last couple of years somehow or the other people are very very eager to file writ petitions in the high courts no doubt when there is grave injustice when it needs to be filed it needs to be filed there is no doubt one has to file it but there should be some limit say for example i am told there were more than 1500 writ petitions filed only in the bombay high court on this point and if you read the judgment i very strongly feel that the sheer number of writ petitions or the writ uh, sorry the petitions that would have been filed before the supreme court against all the high court judgments were about 9000 in number and that was the first and main argument of the learned asg okay see we have made a mistake but see the impact 9000 petitions we are going to file 90148 issue notices have been issued please it's a mistake we have committed i think these sheer numbers to my mind have what have influenced the court were it not possibly for these numbers possibly quite strongly i feel that the court possibly would not have shown so much of indulgence to the department i think that's where i'd like to stop as far as ashish agarwal is concerned because the drama is to still unfold a lot of arguments are to come out we take next a decision of the supreme court in 438 itr 174 this is mitsubishi corporation this deals with advance tax and interest under 234b in the case of non residents as you are aware section 209 gives how you are to compute your advance tax payable under 2091d it says you compute your income tax from that you are to reduce the tax deductible at source the words were tax deductible at source so in the case of all non residents the payers here were supposed to deduct tax so the non residents were sitting aram say saying that it is their liability to deduct tax and they were getting away with making that argument and saying therefore that 234b interest should not be levied <coughs> department was saying that is the provision says deductible but if the payer has not deducted tax and you are aware you are getting the money without tds you should have paid the advance tax but still the non residents were relying upon the words deductible at source and several judgments bombay high court was in favor delhi high court went against and that's when everybody 
woke up to that great problem you can imagine there is tax liability is one thing but the interest under 234b is another great addition to that overall liability all these non residents were sitting tight ke only they will have to pay if at all only the tax not 234b interest that was the situation this matter went up to the supreme court and in this decision the supreme court has held in favor of the ssc that since the provision was saying tax deductible at source even if tax has not been deducted there is no liability to pay 234b interest <coughs> and the main argument which appealed to the supreme court was an amendment made with effect from 14 2012 this was relating to an earlier year but the amendment was made in 14 2012 whereby a proviso was inserted in 2091 d which says that tax deductible is not to be reduced if payer has paid or credited the amount without deductible tax so this loophole has been plugged by way of this proviso now this was the main argument which clicked with the supreme court which says that you see this amendment has been specifically made therefore the law earlier was what it was in favor of the ssc otherwise this amendment becomes an exercise in futility it becomes meaningless therefore they interpreted the subsequent amendment they used the subsequent amendment to interpret the earlier law to say therefore that otherwise this amendment becomes infructuous meaningless earlier provision therefore meant that tax deductible at source so even if it was not deductible 234b interest was not payable this decision applies in favor of every non resident prior to the amendment with effect from 14 2012 You can imagine the sheer number. It is much more than ninety thousand, which was covered in Ashish Agarwal's case. So there are the advantages of going through the normal route. Maybe there is a delay, but the advantages you get a correct interpretation of the law. <clears throat> the reasoning for the Supreme Court to arrive at this decision is most important. it has relied upon the subsequent amendment therefore this decision does not apply only to 234b cases it applies to all such cases where subsequent amendments are made wherein we can make this similar argument that the law earlier is to be interpreted in a different manner otherwise the amendment becomes meaningless of course there is another aspect that the amendment if it is clarificatory that brings into uh, being another set of problems but if the amendment is not clarificatory as it was in this case then the argument will continue to apply <clears throat> mind you this argument can cut both ways you can also rely on it department can also rely upon it a classic case where department can rely upon it is that i believe all of you would be aware of the controversy regarding income from house property in the case of builders they where in respect of unsold stock income from house property is being supposed to, uh, is being brought to tax and there was a big controversy going on there's an amendment there in which says that for the first two years you're not going to be charged so what is the impact of that amendment on the earlier years is the issue this decision of the supreme court will have bearing in such kind of situations another small aspect needs to be noted about this decision this proviso in 2091d was inserted by the finance act 2012 with effect from 142012 finance act 12 with effect from 142012 normally we would understand 142012 means it would apply from ay 1230 but the supreme court It does not go into great detail on this, but it says that the new provision would apply to advance tax payable post one four twelve. 
therefore effectively the supreme court holds it applies from the a by 1314 this one aspect one can bear in mind this important aspect about this decision and possibly it makes lot of sense because your first installment of advance tax for 1213 if we, if it were construed as 1213 first installment would possibly be in june 11 and the amendment would have been proposed in the budget which came in 12 itself that is why finance act 12 so maybe possibly that is one reason they may have felt so though there is no great discussion on this point so wherever this kind of an amendment uh, comes into being this aspect can be kept in mind about this mitsubishi decision we turn next to 436 ITR page one. Shakti Metal Depot. <clears throat> This dealt with section fifty of the Act. The facts were that in the year nineteen seventy four, pardon me, I've got a bad throat. In the year nineteen seventy four, this assessee had purchased a flat. Which was used for the purposes of its business, and therefore it claimed and was allowed depreciation for a period of twenty-one years. Continuously, it claimed and was allowed depreciation. In AY ninety-six, ninety-seven, and AY ninety-seven, ninety-eight, that asset was not used for the purpose of the business, and in, therefore no depreciation was claimed, nor was it allowed. After that gap of two years, the SEC sold that asset in AY ninety eight ninety nine, and sought to claim it as a long term capital gain, saying that Section fifty should not apply. <clears throat> the High Court held. I will stress a little on what the High Court held. The High Court held that this flag still continued to be a part of the block. merely because it was not used for one or two years does not mean that it exited the block it also said and correctly so that the mere fact that you are showing it as an investment in your accounts really has no bearing on the matter therefore high court held section 50 applies to treat it as short term capital gains i went into a little detail in the uh, to the high court decision because the supreme court has not passed a very detailed judgment very short judgment it reproduces a part of a para of the decision of the high court which says what i have just said and it says the reasoning of the high court commends to us and therefore we are dismissing the appeal therefore this is a decision we are aware of many people who tried to wriggle out of section 50 in this manner for one or two years you are saying that it is not used therefore you take an argument that it has gone out of the block all those cases will get impacted by this decision <clears throat> there's small fallout we may consider there are certain observations in that high court decision whether they impact certain other aspects connected to section 50 say we have a bombay high court decision in 384 itr where the bombay high court has held that if you have got a long term capital loss you can bring it forward and set it off against section 50 profit qua a long term qua a long term capital asset if your asset has been a long term capital asset even if section 50 applies to it still it is only for the computation purposes of section 48 and 49 that it is a short term capital gain but actually it is a gain from a long term capital asset and therefore the logic was long term capital loss can be set off against this long term capital gain this was the decision of the bombay high court this was based upon an earlier decision of the bombay high court in ace builders in which case 54e present 54 ec benefit was allowed qua section 50 profits we have bombay tribunal decision several of them which take the view that if your asset is a long term capital asset even if the profits are taxable under section 
you will have to pay tax at the rate of a long term capital gain that is 20% not the 30% these are pretty settled positions as far as bombay is concerned now the point is do these get impacted by this decision of the supreme court i think it needs a lot more study and a lot more thought my prima facie view is possibly these are not impacted but i think it leads a lot more time and study to arrive at a final conclusion on this matter i think time will tell us what will happen in the future but this is one possible problem that may arise post this judgment 438 itr page 1 south indian bank limited <clears throat> this decision also i think it will apply to lakhs of assessees all across the country deals with 14a the assessee had invested in bonds and shares and then heard and therefore earned tax free interest and tax free dividend therefore there were no separate accounts maintained by the assessee therefore the assessing officer made a proportionate disallowance of interest and said this much of interest is attributable or applies qua the tax free income and therefore disallowed that under section 14a <clears throat> supreme court held that if you have mixed funds and if you make an investment in these exempted investments out of these mixed funds if your own tax free funds or own interest free funds are more than the amount of investment it is to be presumed that your investment is out of the interest free funds and therefore there should be no disallowance qua interest the department made a main argument and laid stress upon the fact that the assessee is not maintaining separate accounts it is therefore not able to show that the investment in these from qua these uh, shares and uh, bonds were made out of interest free fund because there were no separate accounts this argument was rejected by the supreme court and they say where do you get the provision that an assessee is required to maintain separate accounts there is no requirement in law that the assessee is to maintain separate accounts and therefore this argument by the department was negative you will appreciate how important this judgment is and to how many assessees across the country it will apply yes in bombay we were sitting put we were pretty safe because of the hdfc bank's judgment which was which has in fact been confirmed by the supreme court but now the supreme court has given its seal of approval to this argument this could apply qua 14a this would apply qua 3613 also in fact there is an earlier decision of the supreme court qua 3613 also where the same logic would apply reliance telecom reliance industries limited 410 itr 466 that decision was relied upon by the supreme court in this decision also so now when we used to argue matters in tribunals before certain members we used to have a lot of difficulties they used to tell us show us from your accounts you are not maintaining separate accounts and therefore this deeming theory will not apply but now fortunately the supreme court decision sorts the problem <clears throat> 440 itr page 1 it's a rather surprising that i think out of five decisions so far three or four decisions are all page 1 of those itrs but so be it <laughs> 440 itr page 1 is a decision of the supreme court in reliance telecom limited this is a decision which is creating a lot of difficulty as of now this deals with section 2542 which gives the tribunal the power to rectify mistakes apparent from record in this case what happened was that the tribunal order went against the ssc the assessee filed a miscellaneous application which we call a miscellaneous application broadly it means an application for rectification so an ma was filed by the assessee in the meantime the assessee also filed an appeal to the high court because otherwise the time would go off 
the tribunal accepted the MA and recalled its earlier order and went on to decide the matter afresh. Department filed a writ petition before the Bombay High Court against the order in the MA recalling the earlier order, which the High Court dismissed. They took the matter to the Supreme Court. Qua the power of the tribunal to rectify, not the merits. The Supreme Court says that the tribunal in its original order had passed a very detailed order. What is permissible under Section 254.2 is only rectifying mistakes apparent from record. It does not include the power to recall an order. Supreme Court says, therefore, now it says the tribunal does not have the power to recall an order. And therefore, the order passed by it was beyond the scope and ambit of 254.2. The only remedy available to the SSC, they said, is that you have to appeal to the High Court against the tribunal order if you are not satisfied. It also goes on to say that merely because in the fresh appeal again, second time, the department argued the matter, even filed writ, uh, the written submissions, does not mean that they have acquiesced in it does not mean that the tribunal has got the power to recall its order. So this makes no difference. Silver lining, they said, okay, but the SSC is getting handicapped because it filed genuinely the MA and it succeeded. That's why it withdrew its appeal before the High Court. So they now say, okay, okay, you are getting to a very disadvantageous situation. So now we will permit you that if you file an appeal within the next six weeks, the tribunal, the High Court will go into the merits of that matter and decide without raising the issue regarding limitation, because otherwise your appeal is time barred by a couple of years. <clears throat> now, there are very many situations whereby we are required to file MAs. If you see the Friday board of the tribunal, you'll find a host of miscellaneous applications. If the view continues, that the tribunal has no power to recall. Let's, let's take a simple example. I've cited a decision of the coordinate bench of the tribunal in Mumbai, or I've cited a Bombay High Court decision. By mistake, they do not consider it. Does it mean that the remedy I have is only the appeal to the High Court? So far, I was getting it in the MA before the tribunal. Tribunal was saying, yes, it's a mistake on our part. So they were recalling the order. Now, go to the High Court, even admission is taking 3-4 years. Final decision will happen 10-15 years thereafter. So, for the mistake of the tribunal, why should the SSC suffer? The most unfortunate part is, <clears throat> this decision has been rendered, unfortunately, at least two earlier decisions of the Supreme Court were not brought to the notice of the Supreme Court. Very sadly, but this is what has happened. We have an earlier decision of the Supreme Court in Honda CL Power Products Limited, which is 295 ITR 466. This was a classic case where I cited a decision of the same bench of the tribunal, a coordinate bench, suppose in Mumbai. I cited a Mumbai bench decision, which by mistake the tribunal omitted to consider. So the decision there went against me. I filed an MA. I have argued this matter. This is a decision I have cited. By mistake, you have not considered it. Supreme Court in that case said, of course, why should the necessity suffer for a mistake committed by the tribunal? So obviously, in that case, the order would have to be recalled because it is complete overturning of the earlier judgment of the tribunal, is it not? It's a complete overturning. But still, the Supreme Court said yes. Why should an SSC suffer because of a mistake committed by the tribunal? And this was the settled position we were getting away with, and we were succeeding in all MAs before the tribunal, wherever we were making these arguments. Yet another Supreme Court judgment was 305 ITR 227, Saurashtra Kutch Stock Exchange. In this, in fact, a jurisdictional high court decision had remained to be brought to the notice of the 
tribunal. I had not even cited a decision of the jurisdictional high court. Still, Supreme Court says yes, that constitutes a mistake apparent from record. Obviously, that would result in recalling the order, right? The order in the MA, the order would be recalled and the judgment reversed. But now we have this decision of the Supreme Court, which unfortunately did not have the benefit of the earlier judgments. And today it is saying the tribunal has no power to recall its order. Now, until this situation gets sorted out, we are in a big mess. Let's see how uh, this gets resolved. You may appreciate a mistake apparent from record may possibly necessitate the entire order being recalled. Obviously, because a decision say of the Bombay High Court I have cited is not considered, it will need necessarily to rectify that mistake. It would need that the earlier order is to be recalled. Therefore, to say and make a blanket statement that you cannot recall the order by the tribunal in persons of power under 254.2 is creating a lot of difficulties. Let's see how uh, the matter proceeds from this. <clears throat> a very good judgment of the Supreme Court in 436 ITR 532. MM Aqua Technologies Limited. This deals with 43B and explanation 3C there too. This was dealing with the AY 9697. And the assessee in that case, as part of a rehabilitation plan, it requested the bank and the bank agreed to accept debentures of the SSE company towards the discharge of the outstanding interest. I claimed the deduction of that interest, <clears throat> obviously, but the department disallowed under section 43B, saying that there is no actual payment. AY being 9697. <coughs> By Finance Act 2006, Explanation 3C was inserted in Section 43B with retrospective effect from 1489. 1489 by Finance Act 2006. Therefore, obviously, the AY 9697, which was the year in this assessee's case, was covered. The explanation 3C broadly says the interest remaining unpaid which has been converted into a loan or money shall not be deemed to have been actually paid. Shall not be deemed to have been actually paid. On the face of it, we would feel that assessee has no case because there's a retrospective amendment. It also says for the removal of doubts. The, the proviso specifically says so. The Supreme Court says it relies on the circular explaining the amendment. It says explanation 3C to section 43B applies to those cases where there is misuse of section 43 being made whereby interest, etc. is being converted into borrowals. But genuine cases should not be hit by the amendment. Relying upon the circular, the Supreme Court says that the genuine cases should not be impacted by the judgment. It says the assessee's case was a bona fide one, looking to the facts, the rehab, the bank having agreed. And the most important part it noted that the bank in that year of receiving the debentures had accounted for the interest as its income. The whatever was received at that point of time, the bank showed as its income. So all these impress the Supreme Court to say that this is a bona fide, genuine case. And it holds in the words of the Supreme Court, it says a retrospective provision. This is very important. A retrospective provision 
which is for the removal of doubts cannot be presumed to be retrospective even where such language is used if it alters the law as it earlier stood so despite it saying for the removal of doubts despite it being a retrospective amendment still supreme court holds that it cannot amend the law as it earlier stood this is so important retrospective amendment as also the specific words saying for the removal of doubts despite that looking to the bona fides of the ssc's case the supreme court held in favor of the ssc and said that explanation 3c does not apply you can imagine in how many cases this decision can help the ssc even when there are retrospective amendments mind you so many cases can be this decision can come to the rescue of so many situations it's unbelievable it also held that if at all there is any ambiguity in explanation 3c that ambiguity is to be in favor of the ssc it is to be interpreted in favor of the ssc <clears throat> i don't think anybody is noted but just struck me just see the words in explanation 3c it says interest remaining and remaining unpaid which has been converted into a loan or borrowing shall not be deemed to have been actually paid it says shall not be deemed to have been actually paid just contrast this word if it said shall be deemed to have not been actually paid there's a difference if the words were shall be deemed not to have been actually paid possibly there would be a difference but it says shall not be deemed to have been actually paid if you in detail consider these words it can possibly make a dif difference like i said this this decision can apply to a whole lot of situations say one thing that readily comes to my mind is 3615a which deals with the amendment uh, qua uh, employees contribution to pf there also the words in the explanation are very broad shall be deemed never to have been these are the kind of words fortunately that amendment is with effect from 1421 but department is arguing otherwise and they are going to argue otherwise in whole lot of other situations this is a decision which will come to the help of the assessee in that case <clears throat> i now come to a few bombay high court judgments the very first i'd like to take up for the sheer number it would cover is a bombay full bench decision in 434 itr page 1 mohammad farhan a sheik versus dcit this is in the context of 271 1c thousands and lakhs of matters still pending qua 271 1c as you're all aware 271c has two limbs concealment of income or furnishing inaccurate particulars these are two limbs of 271c you are supposed to initiate penalty proceedings in the assessment order there has to be a finding therefore assessment orders used to say a lot of different different kind of things and this came up for consideration before various tribunals and courts assessment orders used to say penalty proceedings are hereby initiated that's one thing they could say it used to say assessee has furnished inaccurate particulars leading to concealment of it thousands of orders we have seen like this some assessment orders were clear when they said initiate 271c for furnishing inaccurate particulars or for furnishing or for concealment of it come they were clear and precise <clears throat> so stated in the assessment orders the notices in most cases at least until some time ago they referred to both the limbs without a tick mark on the relevant one or the deletion of the non relevant one lot of controversies arose because of this i think first decision was the karnataka high court decision where this issue raked up Bombay High Court in Kaushalya's case, two one six ITR six sixty, which said that even if there's a problem in your notice, there is no relevant X mark. If your assessment order is clear, 
there is no problem. Department can levy the penalty. So if your assessment order was clear and there was a no tick in your notice, still it was fine as far as the department is concerned. Bombay High Court in another decision took a contrary view. Goa Dorado Promotions 433 ITR. It said, no, no, no. Your notice should tick mark the relevant one or delete the inappropriate one. If there's a problem in your notice, the entire penalty goes. So there was this conflict between the Bombay High Court itself. That's why the matter went to the full bench. The full bench has held in favor of the SSC. It says that even if the assessing officer in the assessment order specified the limb, but if your notice did not contain just that one tick mark, the full bench says your penalty is bad in law. We are succeeding day in and day out on 271C matters on this point. It, it holds that the assessment and the penalty proceedings are not composite provisions or composite proceedings so that you can take support from one to the other. The penalty proceedings must stand on its own steam, on its own legs. And of course, since it's a penalty provision, it should be very strictly construed. Notice should be precise. There is no room for any ambiguity. So relying upon the Supreme Court's decision in Dilip Shroff's case, which deprecated this practice of such notices, the full bench has taken the view that even if your assessment order is clear, if in your notice the relevant tick mark is not there, the penalty fails. You can imagine how widely applicable this decision is. Every possible case of 271C gets covered because in 99% of the cases, those notices do not contain the relevant tick mark. In fact, there is a suggestion. I have no problem with this. I have no problem with this. <laughs> I have a suggestion, in fact, if you have any penalty matters pending, say, before the tribunal, I would suggest file an early hearing application, get done with your case ASAP. One doesn't know what the Supreme Court may hold tomorrow. While we have the benefit of the Bombay High Court decision, get going. And possibly a lot many matters may get covered in the tax effect uh, circular also. So if you have a penalty of less than a crore, there would be no appeal even to the High Court. So that's how you take uh, try and take advantage of a particular situation. <clears throat> I'll come to Bombay High Court decision, but at this stage, I will take up a Delhi High Court decision because it is somewhat connected to this point. 443 ITR 186, Schneider Electric Southeast Asia Private Limited. This is connected to the Bombay High Court decision. We now have, in place of 271C, we have 270A and 270AA. In this case, the assessee applied for the grant of immunity under 270AA, which was denied by the AO. In a writ petition, the High Court held that this action of the assessing officer is not justified. It is arbitrary. One, because the notice did not specify whether it was a case of under-reporting or misreporting. So this logic of 271C is now being used even in 270A penalty. The AO is supposed to point out to you whether it's a case of under-reporting or misreporting. Further, the court says that there is not a whisper in the order as to why the AO says that this is a case of misreporting. If you say so, then you have to prove it. Why this is falling under 270A9 as a case of misreporting? Merely saying in the assessment order that this is a case of misreporting will not serve the purpose of the department. In fact, it goes on further to say that this is a case where the assessee voluntarily filed a competition of income with a view to buy peace and uh, put an end to litigation. And therefore, this was not a case of misreporting. No further facts are stated, but they say because of this, 
it is not a case of misreporting therefore it directed the ao to grant immunity from the penalty i think this is the first decision at least i have come across in the context of 270a penalty the argument regarding the specification of the limb has been extended even to 270a penalties in fact i have also seen quite a few orders where with a view to stop you from possibly applying for the immunity the assessing officers are very often saying in the assessment orders that initiate penalty for misreporting of income all those cases where you could possibly apply for an immunity you may want you may want to consider merely because he says so in the assessment order that this is a case of misreporting does not mean that it becomes a case of misreporting he still has to prove it so even if you file an application for immunity he still has to demonstrate as per this decision he has to demonstrate that this is a case of misreporting and only then he can say that the immunity will not be applicable to so much for this decision of the delhi high court on 270a <clears throat> Four thirty-two ITR two seventy-seven, another Bombay High Court decision, <clears throat> Alcon Developers. This is in the context of Section seventy-two, carry forward and set off of unabsorbed losses. You are all aware seventy-two says unabsorbed business losses can be set off against business income. It's also settled by several decisions, including those of the Supreme Court. that what the section requires is business income need not be under the head business so therefore suppose a stock broker is earning dividend or a person who is engaged in trading in shares is, is uh, earning dividend it would normally be have been income from other sources because there was a specific provision there but it being business income set off could be claimed though it is not taxable under the head business <clears throat> so in this case the assessee had sold the assets of a business undertaking and certain capital gains came to be charged under section 50 as short term capital gain assessee had business losses earlier and it claimed the set off of the unabsorbed business losses against section 50 profit saying that these are assets of the business itself which have been sold and therefore though it may be capital gain but still it is business income this was denied by the department matter went up to the bombay high court unfortunately i could not find a lot of clarity qua whether it goes to the entire extent or only part but one thing is clear bombay high court in this decision says at least to the extent of the depreciation which has been recouped that is business income and therefore though it may be taxed under section 50 you can get the set off of the unabsorbed business loss yes only to the extent of the unab uh, the depreciation which has been recouped i could not find clarity qua the balance portion so just by way of an example your assets costed 100 wdv is say 30 you sold for 120 your 90 would become your section 50 profit difference between 120 and 30 90 would become your uh, section 50 profit but at least to the extent of 70 which is a recoupment of the depreciation in this case was held to be business income against which unabsorbed business losses could be set off <clears throat> this helps a uh, lot of assessees who have had losses they sell assets this year they are uh, because of difficulties first of all they have sold assets but they land up having to pay tax but this decision is what would come to their help to say that the unabsorbed business loss can be set off against this capital gain connected to this is a decision of the karnataka high court in 436 itr 238 this is nandi steels limited the same view has been taken here in fact it has gone the whole hog the entire section 50 profit has been held to be business income and the unabsorbed business loss have been allowed to be set off against the section 50 in fact those of you may recollect 
there was a decision of the uh, tribunal special bench in nandi steel's case karnatak uh, bench of the tribunal that decision has been reversed in this decision by the karnatak high court it has gone the whole hog so both these decisions can be useful in uh, such cases bombay high court in the case of peter vaz another important decision which i wanted to share with a uh, lot of you professionals 436 itr 616 there's a reason why i'm dealing specifically with this judgment there needs to be a little clarity on a few concepts see normally appeals are filed by um, the chartered accountants normally very limited cases go to the council at the drafting stage unfortunately sometimes when the matter comes to us later on we find there are lot of difficulties possibly cos are not filed grounds are not filed various kind of problems arise so to do away with this kind of problem i thought i should deal with this decision and in the process explain a few concepts <clears throat> let's demonstrate this with an example suppose before the cit appeals you have filed an appeal there are two points you are challenging the reassessment under 147 and you are challenging the addition on merits both aspects are there both these grounds are there before cit appeal <clears throat> cit appeal goes against you on the 147 but on the merits he goes in your favor unfortunately i have seen many assessees do not file appeals because they are satisfied that the merits addition has been deleted sometimes they don't realize that, that is not yet final department is going to go in appeal so please it makes sense that you should file the appeal so first situation is without waiting for the department to file an appeal you file an appeal qua that part of the order whereby 147 has been decided against you So you should file your appeal, and when the department files its appeal, both these appeals normally would be heard together because they are the same assessee, the same years. These are referred to as cross appeals. So this is one concept. <clears throat> Another option you have is you wait. You may be hopeful that the department will not file an appeal, but don't rely on that. My advice. And the other option to you is you wait for the department to file the appeal then having got the form 36 from the tribunal you have 30 days where by you can file a cross objection in that cross objection you can raise the ground regarding the 147 so therefore when both are heard together the department's appeal and your cross objection both the issues will be decided the 147 as also the merits but practically speaking sometimes you miss out you know people say okay tribunal or i have got the form 36 from the department just file it we'll see when the hearing comes in the process you miss out on filing this you that is why i suggested first of all only you should file the appeal theek hai if you are uh, uh, prompt enough if you realize it you can file your co also <clears throat> there is yet another concept of rule 27 of the itat rules let me explain this with an example suppose qua those merits you had made two alternative arguments i am not on 147 i am only on the merits qua those merits if you had made two alternative arguments one argument was rejected by the cit appeal the second argument was accepted and therefore the addition on merits was deleted so you have succeeded you would normally not file an appeal on the merits you have succeeded on it so no problem rule 27 of the itat rules which is a very well known principle it says that the respondent may support an order appealed against on any of the grounds decided against him even though he may not have filed an appeal respondent may support an order on any of the grounds decided against him even though he may not have filed an appeal this means that in that when that merits appeal of the department is taken up i will not be restricted to only that 
second argument which the cit appeal decided in my favor which he accepted by relying upon rule 27 the argument which was relied upon before the cit appeal even that can be made because all that i am doing by making that argument is supporting the order of the cit appeal this is what rule 27 permits me to do so this is i wanted to clarify these concepts of the cross appeal cross objection and rule 27 <clears throat> now what happened in this decision <clears throat> because of a problem it arose this situation arose and this is what the decision holds in 153c proceedings an addition under 222e in respect of deemed dividend was made in the case of an ssc <clears throat> he went up and appealed to the cit appeal only on the ground regarding the merits <clears throat> the 153c jurisdiction argument was not taken nor was a ground even taken on the merits 222e addition deleted by cit appeal department went in appeal to the tribunal on the deletion of the 221 222e on merits at that time it struck the ssc maybe his counsel then advised him that you have the argument of the jurisdiction under 153c so we should take this up it was taken up before the tribunal rule 27 also was relied upon even a co was filed but the tribunal both rule 27 it did not permit even the co said it is barred by time therefore they will not permit it <clears throat> matter went up to the high court and the high court accepted the claim of the ssc it says the challenge to the jurisdiction under 153c goes to the root of the matter by making this challenge to the 153c what you are doing is only supporting the deletion of the addition on merits by the cit that's all you are doing that's what the high court says all you are doing by raking up another argument under 153c is that you are supporting the order of the cit appeal having deleted the addition on merits therefore this is covered under rule 27 also this is what the bombay high court held <clears throat> it is most important to note that normally rule 27 applies where you have taken a point before the cit appeal which he rejects but here the bombay high court has gone a step further to say that even had you not taken up this issue before the cit appeal still you can avail of rule 27 to say that since this goes to the root of the matter the jurisdictional issue all that you are doing is trying to support the order of the cit appeal deleting the addition under 222e and it was accepted it also held that your cross objection should have been that is another aspect of the matter they said even the cross objection should have been allowed the condonation or delay relying upon master kathiji etc all those string of decision it says that in the co should have been condoned and therefore even from that angle the argument regarding 153 could be taken up so they realize the importance of this decision that despite not having taken that ground or made that argument before cit appeal still you are able to avail of rule 27 that is not to say we should make this effort i would suggest you should definitely at the first instance take up the argument don't wait for the appeal to come from the department please file your appeal don't wait for them to file a co no please file your appeal only in the unfortunate situation of getting caught up as happened in this case this decision would possibly help you <clears throat> this decision can apply in a whole lot of situations 153c 147 we have other decisions also 147 was originally not even taken up before cit appeal but before the uh, tribunal in the department's appeal regarding deletion of the merits we have raised the argument regarding 147 and we have succeeded relying on rule 27 to say that all i am doing is supporting the order of the cit appeal not to say that we must not take up the argument but these decisions are also there to help us to say that 
rule 27 can be relied upon if you have a good case on 147. <coughs> Yet another wonderful decision of the Bombay High Court. You want me to go on to? Right. Okay, fine. All right. I'll just take two decisions quickly. <clears throat> Bombay High Court uh, 325 CTR 377, Pawan Morarka's case. Very interesting decision. This deals with section 150, which relaxes the time limit under section 149 for reopening of assessments. Under 150, the reassessment can be made at any time. The facts in this case were, a company advanced certain monies to a concern. 222E was applied <coughs> and the department made the addition in the hands of that concern. The matter went up to the Delhi High Court. Delhi High Court holds, you can make the addition only in the case of, if at all, the shareholder. It cannot be made in the hands of the concern under section 222E. That's what it held. So you cannot add in the hands of the concern. But it made observations saying that it is open to the revenue to take remedial measures to tax dividends in the hands of the shareholder. Normally, such observations are always there. We have seen it before CIT appeals, we have seen it in tribunals, we have seen it in high courts. High court said it is open to the revenue to take remedial measures to tax dividend in the hands of the shareholder. Under normal provisions of 149, the reassessment in the hands of the shareholder would be barred. Department sought to rely upon section 150 to say that after this decision of this high court, we can reopen or make a reassessment in case of the shareholder. So high court construes section 150. It's very interesting. It says, <clears throat> The reassessment notice must be issued in consequence of or to give effect to any finding or direction. Therefore, you have to give effect to a finding or direction. These two words. Finding. Finding, it says, and it's well settled. Finding means something which is necessary to dispose of a case. To dispose of the case of the concern before the Delhi High Court, there was no need to make any observations or giving any finding qua taxability in the hands of the shareholder. Therefore, these observations of the High Court were not a finding necessary to dispose of the appeal of the concern. So it is not a finding. Next word was direction. Can it be a direction? Direction, it says, is something which is in the nature of an order which requires positive compliance. That is a direction. I direct you to do this. That means you must comply with it. What had been, what did this uh, high court say? It is open to the revenue to take remedial measures to tax the dividend in the hands of the shareholder. This is not a direction. At best, it is an option to the department. And an option is not a direction. Since it was neither, they say 150 cannot apply in such a case. Further note the words. It says, to give effect to a finding or direction, contained in an order, note these words now, passed by any authority in any proceeding under this act. Passed by an authority in any proceeding under this act. The High Court is not an income tax authority under section 116. Therefore, 
those observations were not passed by an authority in any proceeding under this act so even that is not covered note the further words in section 150 says passed by an authority in any proceeding under this act or by a court in any proceeding under any other law see the words passed by the court in any proceedings under any other law now this is a decision by the court under the income tax act not under any other law so even this limb of section 150 was not satisfied therefore the bombay high court held that section 150 extended time limit cannot apply in the facts of this case there are several other reasons it's an interesting decision to read several other reasons given but i am stressing on these uh, this interpretation of section 150 this decision is a decision of great practical utility happens very often that they have taxed something or disallowed something in one hand and then thereafter they become wiser and seek to tax it in other hands relying upon possibly some directions or observations of the appellate authorities this is a decision which can take care of those situations and help you to say that the reassessment proceedings in the case of the second person are barred by time i'll just take one more decision uh karnataka high court in 430 itr 527 tally solutions case this deals with disallowance under section 40a1 which you are aware is a disallowance for failure to deduct tax the issue was whether depreciation in respect of intellectual property rights which had been acquired by the ssc would be subjected to the disallowance under 40a1 on the ground that tax had not been deducted note the words section 40 says notwithstanding anything to the contrary in sections 30 to 38 the following amount shall not be deductible while computing the income under the head profits and gains of business <clears throat> and 40a1 refers to interest royalty fees for technical services or any other sums chargeable under this act on which tax has not been deducted so note the word expenditure is not used anywhere in 40a1 or 40a1a but the high court holds that the words amounts payable used in section 40 refer to expenditure incurred for the purpose of the business which is revenue in nature and which is claimed as a deduction this is the view of the karnataka high court your depreciation claim in that case is not an expenditure which you have claimed as a deduction it is not revenue in nature and therefore for these reasons the high court held that the depreciation could not be the subject matter of disallowance under 40a1 even if tax had not been deducted in respect of the same so you have situations now where even if you have not deducted tax qua an income of a non resident still you can possibly get away with the disallowance under 40a1 i am not telling you to do it but this is a decision if you are caught in the caught in a problem this is a decision that can be of great use like i said earlier the word expenditure was not specifically used in section 40 in fact it says not which signing anything contained in 32 38 which would possibly include depreciation also somebody could possibly make an argument capital expenditure could be covered but they say no no it refers to depreci it refers to expenditure and depreciation is not an expenditure it is an allowance it is a statutory allowance allowed to you under the act not an expenditure and therefore cannot be subject matter of disallowance under 41 this decision also specifically holds that this same logic applies even to 40 a 1 a so even 40 a 1 a cases expenditure is the criteria i had a few decisions but i think i will uh, pause here 
I, if you want, I'll just give the citations. Just, and just two Mumbai tribunal decisions. I could uh, suggest that you all read the same. 217 TTJ 513. This is Kalpesh Synthetics. This is a very important judgment. Brings out various facets of uh, adjustments made in intimations under section 143.1. Is a decision worth reading? Very many aspects brought out. And yet another decision is 213 TTJ 1058. Again, Mumbai Tribunal. Lena Power Tech. This was those cases of. Uh, share capital issued by companies and this decision you should read this is a lesson how the tribunal can demolish your case this is a lesson to be learned from this decision the kind of detail it went into and completely demolished the assessor's case the assessor was saying I, I filed all the details here is the balance sheet capacity is proved how all that is broken in this decision is worth reading i think with this i will conclude but not without thanking each one of you, including the ones virtually present, for a very patient hearing. Thank you. <clears throat> you can, if you can read it out to me. Some of you have answered, but just, you know, I think uh, whether decision of SC, that is SC, uh, Ashish Agarwal, would cover SSCs who were not party to the underlying writs filed before various high courts and still have received notices? I think yes. I think yes. Because of uh, Article 142 being invoked. It has all India. Uh, is there a benefit or defense of saying that there is a change of opinion available to SSC under new provisions? According to me, yes. If you recollect, uh, under the old provisions, there was no specific mention in the provisions regarding change of opinion. It is mostly judge-made law mm -hmm. and uh, mainly Calvinator's judgment of the Supreme Court, which said that you have the power to reassess and not to review. Based on that, the concept of change of opinion is what was brought about. So they said change of opinion is not permissible. To my mind, even today, what is permissible is reassessment, not review. And therefore, the same argument can be developed. Of course, but we have to convince the courts. Can period of reopening for notices issued between 1 for 21 and 30th June 21 be restricted to 6 years and not 10 years? Why, why would that be so? If they say the new provisions apply in a case where the 10 year period would apply, 10 year would, unless you make out a case that earlier they were already time barred. That is an argument that will develop. Yes. Yes. That is represented by an asset. No, not that. Uh, huh. There's a provisor which says that uh, in case it was earlier barred before this that, that's what? applicable by the time limit. Yes. Then that, uh, you know, but then it cannot be reopened. See, the point is, the argument is that if under the old provisions, they were barred by time already. To my mind, yes, we have a very strong case to say that you cannot start afresh because I have a vested right. There's a very well settled pro. But that exception there, which refers to 149 1B case that refers to six years only that 149 1B there refers only to the quantum of income, which, which was more than one lakh or whatever the figure was there. But that is apart from that reference to that proviso, if according to me under general provisions of vested right, if earlier it has become time barred, you cannot reopen under the new provisions. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Um, this is a uh, why does notice under uh, section 271C come after one year of completion of scrutiny assessment? I think that's an issue where you can raise a doubt as to whether it was actually issued earlier. Earlier, right. Unless your assessment order says so, that it is initiated, they, they could make a case out that it is a sheer mistake or something. Uh, so last question. Supposing interest payable is converted into share capital, say preference shares, can I say 43B explanation 3C is not applicable and is allowed uh, reference MM Equa case? You had what was interest was converted into preference shares. Preference shares. Share. Okay. I think the same logic if it's a genuine case, if you're, if you're doing it just internally, I think proving the bona fides might become a problem. 
if you are say to your family members or your group concerns you were to pay interest and you have just converted into preference share possibly uh, attempting it in these cases would be a problem don't try it you might create problems for this decision also so uh, thank you sir uh, thanks a lot thank you thank you mr hero rai there are more than 320 people who have benefited from this extremely lucid lecture and the reason i believe why mr hero is so popular is it's not one there are many is the lucidity with which he covers these complex subjects the second is the selection of these decisions spanning supreme court high court and when you hear him you feel that he is not talking out of the sky high funda corporate judgments this is something which you and i have actually gone through with our clients these are the simple matters which have become complex due to interpretations due to abuse or whatever it is but something which you really can relate to and the third reason why he really sounds so familiar is he can actually predict what would be the implication of this decision i think these are some of the rare qualities which you find only in extremely competent speaker and professional thank you so much mr hero rai before before i hand over the dais to zubin bilimoria for uh, formal vote of thanks and the announcements may i offer a small memoir which is a normal practice of uh, bcs to be given to the speaker for his memory and may i request uh, please jagdish punjabi managing committee member giving it to hero rai thank you over to you zubin for formal vote of thanks a very good evening to one and all to the respected speaker to the vice president cme hardik past president gautam and my other professional colleagues first some announcements of certain forthcoming events lecture meetings over the next maybe 2 to 3 weeks the first one coming up immediately tomorrow and day after on 16th and 17th is our internal audit conclave which is scheduled to be held in the form of a workshop coordinated by our internal audit committee it is at orchid hotel and in a hybrid mode then there is next the flagship event of the accounting and auditing committee our 11th residential refresher course on indias on the indian accounting standards which is there from 24th to 26th june which is only in physical mode at the deltin hotel the next is a session on 30th june to 1st july by the human resource development committee on the leadership power of attraction which is an interesting topic the speaker is nas chogule who is the co-founder of aspirise so that may be of interest to a lot of you following that on 2nd july is another in topic if i may say so by the technology initiative committee it is a session on data clouds network security and best practices by deepak joveri it is a half day workshop and then finally we have another important event 
the ITF conference, the International Tax and Financial Conference, which is at Udaipur from 4th to 7th August, a galaxy of speakers. So you can enroll or spread the message across. So these are some of the announcements. Now coming to the pleasant task of a vote of thanks, I think our vice president has aptly summarized the various aspects which our renowned speaker has covered for today. He has covered diverse topics right from notices, information, disallowance of interest and dividend, carry forward of losses, and various other topics which are of relevant in a very simple and lucid manner. I am sure all of you have gained. And the greatest testimony is that there were more than 300 people who had virtually joined in. So that itself is also a testimony. So I am sure all of you would have gained a lot of knowledge, a lot of food for thought also for the future, emanating out of the various judgments which he has given and the interpretation. So I would request all of you, including those of you who are virtually there, to carry it through with a loud round of applause. Thank you, sir, once again. Thank you.